Lisa. Yes, baby girl. When I grow up, I want to be a woman to society. And so shall you be. Hey, this is Lisa Landry. Welcome to Womanist to Society. I'm sitting down today with Chris Martin from Hempful Farms. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. My name's Chris Martin. I'm from Arizona. Uh, in 2009, I started an edible company um, due to my diagnosis to Crohn's. Uh, my wife and I were both legal licensed growers here. Um, after we grew our first crop, we had about 24 pounds in excess flour and we knew our license only allowed two and a half ounces mm -hmm. So we were curious on what the best next move was with all this flour considering dispensaries weren't open And we only had collectives to deal with and donate with um, Being a chef my first instinct was just let's cook it and juice it and, and get it in our bodies the best way we could I like your instincts <laughs> it's very natural, very yeah. natural. Um, and uh, literally that's how the company was born because um, you had excess we had flour. so much excess so it worked out great we, we started making the butters and tinctures and, and then it grew into candy bars and um, the brand was unique we were sitting around smoking one evening and I had a wrapper from a sweet tart label and I was folding it and playing with it and Zonka was built out of it and <laughs> literally the next morning we were at Michael's buying candy molds and doing the recipe. Lord's work we were <laughs> Absolutely. Revelation is 22 too yes, we were. <laughs> amen <laughs> yeah we started uh, making products out of the house really and we were donating them to the collectives and the, anywhere we could get products to just so patients had them and some people don't know what a collective is versus a dispensary so yeah a collective is kind of uh, what we put together as patients before the licensing issue here uh, cannabis went legal in 2010 in Arizona but we didn't get a dispensary until 2013 what so we had patients running around for three years Trying to just meet up with people they can make donations yeah. to or Meanwhile, get deliveries. The man's running around trying to arrest you and saying, You have a card, but there's nowhere to get your meds, so it's still illegal. It's just a really bad uh, mess. It was yeah. a big, big mess here. So we just tried to donate as much as we could to those places. So the collectives were great um, source for patients. Mm -hmm. um, they. We knew where to go to give the meds, and they knew where to come get them, so it worked out really good. Um, and then as we grew, uh, the dispensary started to open. Um, my business partner uh, told us that he was taking our products and putting them in the dispensaries on consignment. Um, I noticed my inventory would shrink weekly, and no revenues were coming in, no, no way to recover and, and replenish. So I asked a lot of questions, and I got told that they were being consigned. And about eight weeks later, uh, at almost bankruptcy and breaking point, um, we were raided. What? And I didn't know why. I didn't know what was going on. I was driving my kids to school with my wife. And we left about 7 in the morning, normal routine. Uh, we were actually staying at a brand new home. We had a, a, our prior home in Juniper Hills in Prescott. It had a, a plumbing problem. Mm -hmm. So we were buying a new house, but it wasn't prepared yet. So when the plumbing backed up that night, we just threw a mattress in my truck and we drove to the new place and we stayed on the floor. That next morning on the way to school, I noticed all these unmarked cars oh. and it just seemed off. As soon as we pulled out onto 69, one by one, and as I'm looking in my rear view, I was And you got the kids in the car and you slept on the floor the night before? Yeah, well, literally, my wife and I looked right. like we just got hit by cars. We we were painting and moving. Always the best look for a mugshot. Yeah, it looked, it's it's a rough one. It, and the internet doesn't forget. It's there forever. <laughs> it is there forever. So we, you know, as we drove, and we're now we're two miles into this low-speed chase. I mean, they're, they're not pulling me over. There's 15 of them. Because uh, that's unnecessary. I can see SWAT. I see what's oh, happening. Gosh. I'm just trying to prepare my family. Right. Um, I told my wife. She looked in the mirror and obviously began to shake and get scared. And yeah. we just all could think as the kids. My youngest was six at the time. My other two were in junior high and grade school. And uh, we just, 
my first thought was these guys have to be committing a crime right now for not pulling me over. I mean, this is what causes PTSD. This is what causes these guys to take off and high speed chase and run three counties and they're just messing. Oh, with maybe us. they wanted that. You and want that, some well, drama? You know, I don't know. Who I, knows? We were, you know, by the time we left Prescott Valley and made it to Prescott, that's an eight mile drive. So my thought was, let me drag us through the campus, the college campus. Um, if if they did do something wrong and we run through a college university, then at least it's on paper. Like these guys just stalked us the whole way. <laughs> so once we got into where my kid's school is, it's the busiest intersection in Prescott um, by the hospital, Miller Valley School. Um, Seven thirty in the morning, tanks, ghillie suits. At the um, school. I, I right when I hit the, we had a one turn left to make. It was a red light. Um, right at the red light, we got hit in the middle of the intersection with every vehicle oh, they, they have, had. It's like a warning to the kids. That and a, yeah. and a show. They they paraded us through town. Um, everyone in our town, and we've been there 25 years. My wife's uncle was the mayor oh. for 17 years. I've owned businesses. I've owned a semi-pro football team. Uh, I coach kids. I mean, we've, we've been in the community a long, long time. Uh, People knew who we were. So. And I know you rode for Baca for a while. Or yeah, we, yeah, I, yeah, I did, and I rode with uh, Desert Eagles. I've, we've been a part so of the community know you. group. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely not Your fabric. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, especially at 7.30, and everyone's on their way to work in the middle of a town that we pay taxes in and help build. I mean, uh -huh. we've been there a long, long time. I've owned three restaurants in that town, so I've helped provide into that community for a long time, and to get yeah. treated that way over... A, a, a miswritten law the way it was explained to me in my case a gray area um, you could have knocked on my door you know mm. I could have opened my door and we could have sat down and chatted about it you could have sent Chuck over yeah. you went to high school with him right yeah <laughs> it just it just didn't make sense to me it, I once they hit us that hard it was just at that point you could tell it was a little bit bigger than us it was uh it was a political hit it was uh these guys, it was a lot of gang affiliation. They were looking for Hell's Angels information, all this crazy which stuff. Which is ridiculous because that's we not We don't who have are. anything to do with that. that I mean, yeah. yeah, you got pictures of us all at events hanging out, but that's because there's big events. Right. And we don't start fights with people bigger than us. We just shake hands. That's, right. It doesn't mean we're. Not. And as I later found out, my business partner and co defendant had a lot of other dealings going on that really? I knew nothing about. I found out after the fact. He. Once we got arrested, um, the raid came, they took everything, you know, the typical um, miserable, every jurisdiction, you come home and there's no home and nothing's left. Yeah. I mean, they took everything from vehicles to my kids' birth certificates. We, we had nothing. Um, why would they take your kids' birth certificates? I don't know. I don't know. That, that, I figured that's why I was charged with criminal syndication and organized crime because they were trying to make it look like I was hiding money and a, a mob boss because of the club. and. It really was just a perfect storm. It was just every... You every, got railroaded. I was a babe in the woods, is what yeah. my lawyer told me. You know, you, you just... You had a perfect opportunity for them to come in. And I had an ex-wife who I fought tooth and nail for a daughter who's now 19. Yeah. And she works at the county attorney's office. Ugh. This chick served me with more, more child support and emergency custody paperwork over smoking a joint, which is now... What legal and yeah. which is what paid her child support off. I mean, <laughs> it just it just blows my mind that you know, it. it we, I feel like it's being used for people's advantage. You know, like yeah. my ex-wife, perfect example. We met. I had a quarter pound broke out on the table at a party. We're all smoking. Everything's yeah. great and everything. You know, it's it's grand. We have a kid. We don't really get along. She doesn't want to be with me anymore. Instead of just going, let let's. Well, he smoked pot. Let's get the cops on him. That makes perfect sense, you know. It's you can't awful. just go and just leave. Yeah, you know, it was just a lot a of mess. people can't just do that. That's real savage. Well, it, we had personal issues. You know, she she wasn't faithful. Yeah. I found out it, it got ugly. So then, one, once I found out later in the case that she was involved, it was just like, man, who wasn't yeah. involved on this thing? You know, between right. my co-defendant being a snitch, between my ex-wife just using the whole pot thing against me for her personal gain with my daughter, I was like, well. I never should have been in that county doing anything that I was doing anyway, just because the chavo part. This is what happens. It doesn't matter. You get bigger than them, and you go away. They don't like it. The first um, dispensary license was handed out to the county assessor. Really? Yeah. Uh, three months before my raid. 
How is that even possible that the first one goes to somebody who's supposed to be well, the same way a, in a, a governmental agency when it's a federal offense to smoke? They actually had cops up there that were licensed, licensed police officers, certified that had put in for a dispensary license too. They which didn't get which it. I do applaud. I they mean, I, I think that. everybody, yeah. everybody, you know, should smoke. I agree. <laughs> you know what I mean? I Especially agree. cops see a lot of. Horrible stuff. I, I just I would, have a different issue imagine. with putting me in jail for it. Yeah, that's you know, the difference. You hold me in handcuffs with it, but then you go home and do the same thing or make a profit from it. Yeah. Just, you can't serve two masters, in my opinion. You right. know, how do you get paid from a government that locks us down? Right. And then you're going to go home and make shares and, and money off of the same business. It's, it's kind of the same thing that happened in my case. My co-defendant signed a deal which we didn't know. We all thought we would go in and fight this thing head on. Because you still team. didn't know that he was messing you up. No clue. No, I thought we were all together. Um, I got the red flag when my inventory was right. disappearing. Right, you knew something so was off, but you couldn't prove I it. I just figured it. it's a new business yeah. and we're growing so fast that you know we got to get caught up. And right. What he was saying made sense. It was possible, but uh, it just wasn't true. Um, so you go in and you think y'all are all going to fight this together. And yeah, we walked into court and uh, him and his lawyer were not there anymore. My, my lawyer came in and quit. Said he had health issues. He was. Are the, you kidding me? He was the partner of my co-defendant's lawyer. They were the same. The same law firm. Yeah. So they let you just take all the heat. Yeah, they set me up because if you go to the Arizona Corporate Commission today, mm -hmm. I own Zonka Bars and Zonka Gear. Zonka mm -hmm. Bars is my edible company. Zonka Gear is my clothing company. I only copyrighted them because it was in such a gray area back then. I didn't think a federal trademark would probably be very smart right. to pull the, you know, look, bullseye, look what I'm doing. <laughs> so I just, you know, I'm already out there, so yeah. I just thought I'd wait. Well, while these guys are taking off and setting up this sealed deal to where I'm taking the fall and having to take a plea or go to trial for 127 years, they filed an LLC called Zonka Meds under <sighs> all their names, including the defense attorney. So his name, when you go to the corporate commission today, you will see my co-defendant, Todd James, Conan Matthews, Wayne Lee Gunn, some gentleman I couldn't tell you, and the lawyer, Richard Gaxiola. He was the defense attorney who set the whole deal up. So I wrote a letter to the bar saying, what do I do? Right. I'm being railroaded because I'm a, I went to prison for a joint when I was 19 playing college baseball. So now I'm a historical felon with priors. I've got to have mandatory. When you were a kid. Right. Got to have mandatory minimums for a guy like that. Got to make sure he goes to prison again. You know, he's already been there once. So, I find out about it. I write the bar, and the bar tells me, "Well, if your judge rules that this lawyer did something illegal, then we'll do something about it." Mm -hmm. The problem is the the lawyer and the co-defendant are out of the case. They've signed. Right. They're done. I'm still fighting. That I can't drag them back. He's not on trial. Right. So pretty much the state bar was like, well, we can't help you. You're burnt. They did. So how many times has this happened? Right. Who else has this happened to? You know. And you really have no recourse. Not what? Because what do you do? You're in, you really are in a gray well, area. And they trademarked Zonka. Then they went back because he knew my co-defendant knew that I hadn't trademarked it. We mm -hmm. were partners. Right. He told me not to. It was his deal. Wow. So they went and trademarked Zonka. So I came back and rebranded OG Zonka mm -hmm. Medibles, mm -hmm. and I'm going to roll it out August Excellent. 1st in Nevada. And I, I pretty much, I guess you could say I'm daring them to do something about it. Right. Because well, yeah, technically, you, have the proof. you they, stole from me. Yeah, they haul you into court. Let's go. There you I, go. I'm going to run in with my hair flying back. Let's go. Right. Drag me to court because you really want to talk about what went down? Considering I just got out of prison in February for being the owner and operator of Zonka. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have a record there to be yeah. on record. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what happens from there. Um, but meanwhile, while I was in, you know, fighting this whole time, four years, I started a company called Hempful Farms. Yeah. Um, I had a dispensary agent approach me after hearing our story and was like, you guys are just getting railroaded. So how can I help? I have this high CBD hemp oil. Oh, that's so cool. Can you make the same products? And I told him, I don't, I don't know. I've never done it. I've never even, this was so far back. I, we had never had a lot, we didn't have a lot of experience with CBD or hemp or I was strictly a cannabis company at that time. 
I don't think a lot of people know the difference, especially you know in states that aren't legal. Absolutely. Between the CBD oils and the hemp and the you flour know, and the wax it. and you know. I explain it to my clients like um, I compare it to tomatoes or onions. <laughs> you know, a red onion and a green onion. Mm -hmm. You know, same vegetable, different family. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same plant. They they come from the same thing. It's just a different genome. It's a different family. You know, they have different traits. So hemp's going to have your lower THC or cannabis has higher THC um, and now the the neat thing with some of the sourcing we've done with our hemp company is just like cannabis hemp can be grown specifically for certain things oh yeah so we have fiber <laughs> hemp and we have CBD specific hemp and yeah some of the hemp we grow now is actually beautiful it's it's prettier than some of the the requi that I've seen in some of the dispensaries Mm. <laughs> Purples and crystals. I was like, wow, can you smoke that? Arizona's a very good place for crystals. <laughs> <laughs> we grew them all over yeah, here in the right. state. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it was just neat. We had a chance to take the hip oil and produce some products. And really, technically, we were only doing it to stay relevant and to pay rent. Right. Feed our kids and help people. To help the same people that we have done. With collectives. We, exactly. And, yeah. So it, it, it helped all those things. Um, literally, we, we had to rebuild our lives, you know, four years of fighting your case, every month going to court. Yeah. We left the county up there because the harassment just got so bad. You know, Andy would get pulled over. We had an officer take her tag saying they were illegal. Oh. We go to Footworks. They weren't illegal. The cop just took them. Um, and what do you do? You go file harassment with the sheriff's department that right. just raided you? We found out six months after our raid that the cops that raided us were all in motorcycle club. The chief of Prescott Police, the chief of Prescott Valley Police, and the head of PANT, the Prescott Area Narcotics Task Force, like the FBI guys that kick in your door, the SWAT yeah. team, they were all in the motorcycle club called the Iron Brotherhood. So six months after they raided me, one of my prospects was in a bar. They don't know he's my prospect. He's not wearing colors. We're family club. So if you're out with your family, I don't make you wear colors. Just go with your family. So he's at the bar, but he sees the chief of Prescott Valley Police wearing his colors. Iron Brotherhood, President Bill something, I don't remember what his road name was, but my guy walks up to him, and of course he's going to give him a hard time. He pokes him on the chest and says, what are you, Sons Anarchy? You think you can just do that wherever you want? And they jumped him. Oh. On camera. You can Google it. The, the, it was Arizona's number two hottest story in 2013. And it was the police department being caught up in this big motorcycle club. So wh 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 where would people find that if they were so oh, intrigued? The Prescott to... Daily Courier and the Arizona Republic have tons and tons. All you have to do is Google Iron Brotherhood. It's awesome because it, it pinpoints the retirement of the chief of Prescott, the chief of Prescott Valley, and the head of Pat. They were gone. Mm. So when we get to court, I'm facing 130 years. I really believe in my heart of hearts, which they won't ever admit, I'm sure, but yeah. my plea of two years that was passed to me yeah. was for a couple purposes. One, not to drag it through trial, right. because give me an offer I can't refuse, I have to sign it. Why would you not? And I would sink that town if yeah. we went to trial and all the dirt came out. Because instead of blowing my last seven grand that I had saved up that the cops didn't take from me, right. I didn't drop it into an attorney because I knew that was my God-given right in this country. So I took my last seven grand and I drove it to a private investigator, an ex-cop of 20 years who can't stand them. <laughs> a, guy that, a guy that used to come into my restaurant and eat religiously and told yeah. me if I ever needed anything, just happened to be in the same room when me and my wife got arrested. Whoa. Walked in, put his business card on my shoulder, and I looked up with chills like I have right yeah, now. Yeah, I bet. And said, you know what? I'm going to need you. The and universe is good like that. <laughs> he brought me every piece of dirt I could have ever, more than I could have imagined. And wow. my plea ended up being a two-year deal. So you tell me how I go from 127 years, all this crazy, crazy charges, the way they treated my family, my house, they took everything, yeah. half a million dollar asset forfeiture, but I'm handed a two year plea because I did something so dangerous and so bad. Yeah, right? You know, and honestly, I, yeah. I, I, I denied the plea in court. I, I said no, and my wife panicked because they and my lawyer both said that if I were to go to trial, I'm gonna go in front of the same panel who indicted me, 
they're going to see a big tattooed biker guy right. and they're going to hear marijuana and they're going to hear weapons and they're going to hear all this crazy stuff and they're not going to care about who he healed and who he felt yeah. and it's going to be a slam dunk and I'm going to get a minimum of 30 years and oh gosh is that worth and my lawyer quite frankly he's barred in four states Alan Bickert 86 years old Colombo of Colombo the guy is amazing yeah. he, he he's also why I got two years because the guy he, he knows it. He stopped them at every point that he could, and he mm -hmm. also made me realize that it, we can only do so much in a crooked county. Yeah, when I have a 90-year-old man sitting across the table from me in tears, telling me, take the plea, yeah. because the county you're in is going to sink you and make sure of it, I have no options. That's, yeah. that's what I have to do. So uh, my first thought was when they put the plea in front of me, it was absolutely not. I have to admit guilt for one. I did nothing. You read the 100-page indictment, they don't mention me and my wife's name at all. It's what? My, they don't mention us at all. It's my co-defendant the entire time. They caught him selling to a cop illegally on camera. The cop entrapped him with a green card. We had a case. The guy decided to snitch and leave. I mean, <gasps> that's just point oh blank how, how it went down. And, We're, and I was... Jacked your copy, right? Took it. <laughs> took it. While I'm standing there in front of a judge pleading right. to not send me to prison. And... The main issue was there were three weapons found in the kitchen when they mm. busted him. Uh, he's a felon, so he's not going to take uh. the guns. What we later found out is he illegally signed my name to the lease of the kitchen because I've never met the landlord. I don't even. He came to me as an investor and said, "Hey, I have a kitchen. Here's your keys. Let's go produce." I've never met the guy. Landlord comes after me for the money after the raid because the feds had the place locked up for right. four months. I don't even know the guy. That's when I find out my name was put on the lease. <laughs> So I was charged with constructive possession of the weapons because I own the lease of the building. You're an extremely masculine man, so I don't mean any disrespect by this, but you're like a lifetime movie wife. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> honestly like, wish... It's like, well, this is a horrible, it's a horrible movie where this like really awesome person just keeps getting screwed over and she, <laughs> she just trusts everybody wrong for her. Like, <laughs> kick him in the head and run. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because my wife swore to me when this first came out and we went public with it that we would end up on a lifetime <laughs> network. She swears it. She says that you know that that's what's going to happen. So I actually wrote the screenplay for it already so I know it's... That'd be I cool. already know. Like, yeah, take you it can't to a make whole, it up. Yeah, but you whole, can take it to a whole other level. Yeah. Like Lifetime yeah. Presents. Yeah. The Wrongly Accused Biker. <laughs> <laughs> with the trusting the wrong people. Right? Right? It's funny though. It's just, it's. I, I, I mean, it's funny I now because you have this great attitude yeah. about it because you realize the stupidity and yeah. the chaos of it. And two years, that's not a short time. You could have yeah. killed a, a baby yeah. and been out of prison yeah. sooner. Which Actually, is one of my guys gets out in July. A good friend of mine, he killed his best friend in a DUI rollover and did a year now. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm it's just that you just to him. see it, you know. You yeah. just the comparison. The worth of human life. Absolutely. To, uh, and his bond plant. was twenty grand. I had a half a million dollar bond. And it took everything. And I was in uh, lockdown. I was in a cell by myself. I wasn't allowed to have visitors. Because you're such a threat. Hannibal Lecter. I was. Are you kidding me? No, ma'am. I was put in the front of the bus by myself. Yeah, when I got to prison, I was SDG'd immediately. I was put under cameras. My house was searched every week. Yeah. My person was searched every day. I was put on a terror threat list. I was put on... A terror threat list? Because of my club. As soon as I walked in with a tattoo at Alhambra, which is the central processing, they put you on a gang enhancement list, which if you'll you never allow to leave the yard. You'll never allow to go get a good job in the prison. Yeah, you're just screwed from the gate. I couldn't have visitors. I, I didn't get to see my wife until I had 60 days left. Oh. And that's after I threatened with a lawyer. Right. I just, like, you're you're, avoid, you're denying me my right to associate with my family. Right. I didn't lose that right to go into prison. Right. Well, she's your co-defendant. She wasn't my co-defendant. She was charged with possession of cannabis. Actually, possession of narcotic, two-wit cannabis, possession of paraphernalia as a card holder. Those were her charges. I, think, oh, yeah, I thought you couldn't... Have that charge if yeah. you're a card holder. Arizona, paraphernalia. Arizona, you can. What are you supposed to smoke your medicine with? Exactly. I don't understand how she was. She was pretty much bullied to take the plea. When we sat in court for Andy, I walked in on her birthday. It was a normal court hearing. Four sheriffs walked up around me, around the chair, and enclosed on me to where I couldn't see my wife at the podium. So I stood up. I figured if I was going to get my ass kicked, then someone's coming with me. 
-hmm. And as soon as I stood up, all of them, I had two guys on this side grab this arm and two guys on this side grab this arm. And they just, their chest protectors came in on me to where I couldn't move. But I wasn't getting arrested. I, they weren't putting handcuffs on me. I'm just kind of like back and forth. What are we doing here, boys? What, what's mm -hmm. the problem? And as I looked around, they're arresting my wife on her birthday. Mm -hmm. She was on pretrial release as a patient, but they you ate her. And because she used her medicine, they violated her pretrial, had me come up with 15 grand in bond to bail her out. We thought this was all a normal procedure. Well, the detective in my case who's been crooked from day one, Randy Johnson and Mark McLean, my private investigator let us know about all the dirt on these guys. I don't know how to connect the dots until my wife gets arrested. I'm driving home on her birthday from Camp Verde to Prescott in tears, trying to think, oh. how am I going to tell her kids? Right. How do I tell my kids that mom's not coming home? I just, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer. So as I'm driving, Andy calls me collect. She's shaking, crying all the time. She doesn't never been to jail. She's, she's, other than the raid. I mean, now we really don't know why she's in jail. She's screaming, Randy Johnson is in the jail. Huh? The detective. Uh huh. Why is he in the jail? He's in a jailer's uniform trying to ask me questions about the raid. So I immediately lose it on the phone because I know it's recorded. Don't touch my wife. I'll have your job. I'll have your family. I'm coming to get her right now. They wouldn't even put a bond on her until the next morning. So they would keep her there so this guy could come and harass her. I told her if he comes near you, in your cell, around you, you just scream. Right. Talk, you make the biggest scene. You don't let anyone near you. You tell them you want your lawyer there right now. So we went. I went straight to my lawyer. Al, oh, this is what's happening. This is, you know, I need help. He subpoenaed for the phone record so that way we would at least have record of right. us talking yeah it's all recorded it is it's recorded so you can subpoena those records not if the phones don't work on the day that you subpoena for the oh, phone call does that ever happen uh, that you happen know it seems America? to be common practice in really? Yalapai county oh yeah huh. yep common practice so the more we dug the more we dug the more we dug the more we found mm -hmm. uh, i ended up taking my last prized possession harley davidson and selling it i moved my family to this home here in Phoenix, Arizona. I ran from that county because uh, my dog had been let out of the yard and beat up. Uh. My wife has had the tags taken off her car. My house has been surrounded for malicious dog phone calls because supposedly my Rottweiler gets out of the yard all the time. Yet my video shows the police letting him out of my gate and then jumping on him and beating him up. Uh. Showing it. I have video. I went to Mark Victor's office to show a video. Who's Mark um, Victor? He's a cannabis and criminal attorney here in Arizona that is usually pretty, pretty helpful with cases like this. Okay. Uh, after the dog issue, I knew that we needed to leave uh, yeah. during my court hearing because they were just going to push until yeah, you're something unsafe. went bad. You're marked. I got down here. We opened up Hempful Farms Cafe. Um, we got the Hemp Infused Restaurant going. We're selling our products. We're doing all this great stuff. And uh, in March, we got robbed by a homeless guy. Yeah. Throws a rock through, steals some stuff. We're not in the best area. It happens. Three months later, my alarm goes off again. We get a call. Hey, the police are on their way. They're going to check your place out. Great. We're on our way too. Get a call back five minutes later. Hey, the police didn't find anyone. They're going to lock up and go. Excuse me? They're going to lock up and go. Uh, no, I would like the sergeant or whoever's on duty to stay nice. exactly where they're at stay when I are. get there. <laughs> Someone needs to be there. Yeah. We show up. No one's at my place. And my building is locked. So now I'm panicked. I don't know. Are there cops in my building? Are there robbers in my building? Is there anyone in my building? Why is no one there to tell me what's going on? So Andy gets back on the phone with ADT. You know, I want badge number. I want department. I want to know everything, which they're not willing to give us. So I just go into the film. I want to see my film. My, that's got to tell me something. The compute, the ADT tracking says that my north unit door was opened. The video shows the motion went off because there's flashlights shining through my window. You go to the west side where the door was actually breached and it shows a cop walk up and shine them. And this YouTube footage oh. is on my Hempful Farms page. Wow. YouTube, Hempful Farms Cafe, you can go right on it. The cop walk, the two cops, they park their car diagonally in my spaces. They get out. We're closed at this time. They get out. You see a flashlight shine right into my camera. Hand go down to my door. Door pops wide open. You watch it. So when I was robbed in March, these guys came in 
guns drawn, six of them back to back. I watched it. They ran through. They cleared all my room. For why? These guys, when they came in, they had their hands in their pockets, flashlights out. Now, supposedly, it's a burglary call. You know, the alarm went off, according to the ADT, because yeah. of a burglary. Someone broke in. Well, it shows that the motion detector was set off by a flashlight. So the cops were casing my place. Right. Then they go to the front door with a, a master key and walk right in. On camera, you see them take honey sticks from my register side, put them in their pocket. They take business cards, put them in their pocket. They don't even clean, clear the retail shop. They don't even go in and look. No. So they're not there for burglary, obviously. Then they disappear into my office. Ten minutes later, the camera shows them walk out and leave, lock my door. Right. And it's over. Two days later, I'm logging in on my computer. Right. And as I'm checking my, I'm checking everything, I get hacked. It's a, it's called a keystroke logger, login hacker. When those guys went back in on the, they said they something on put, your computer. When I had my IT guy. Because, you know, in a club, we, we have ways to find out info just like they do. I had my IT guy um, do a reverse IP address search. And at first, it went to, like, a, a, a some African IP address, like, almost... It was a Nigerian prince? A Nigerian. It was supposed <laughs> to look like it was coming from Nigeria yeah. as a hacker. Right. But the more we searched, it was actually linked to a lieutenant and the Yavapai Police Department hiding under a Nigerian IP address. What? So I took it to Mark Victor and showed him this video. I showed him all this past stuff, everything, and I got told I needed more evidence. So I knew at that moment, right then, that if I don't sign this two-year plea and get yeah. the hell out of here, yeah, I'm done. Right. I just knew it. it. You could see, and I'm not suggesting Mark works for them, or, but he probably knows. Like my lawyer knew, the county screwed. I went to talk to another attorney just to get the consensus. They wanted fifty grand up front. Well, what for? Well, you know, 10 grand goes to this judge, 10 grand goes to the county, 10 grand. And he gave me a breakdown of where all the money's going to go to make sure the payoffs happen the way they need to happen. I was just like, so I get extorted for half a million dollar forfeiture, and I'm expected to come up with another 50 grand to pay my lawyers to right. ensure I don't get extra prison time? That's how the system works now. That's, ex I mean, it's, I just watched it for that's six so years. It's crazy to think that it's that decrepit. It's broken. You know? Super broken. When I got when I came home, it was I had the option, reopen the cafe, mm -hmm. do our products again just like we did before. But I feel like the feds are pushing. They're, they're, whether what they can and can't do is at my call. Right. If they they see a kid that's already done this twice now in, in prison, and I'm coming out and producing my stuff without a license, right, or without a GMP facility, then I'm asking for it. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. So I I shut down the a uh, couple investors and ideas to franchise the cafe. Um, I've linked with a dispensary and a wholesale license to help relaunch my cannabis brand. And we've also linked with Flourish Cannabis, who, who is going to help us build out our kitchen and produce our products. We launch in Vegas in August. Congratulations um, and welcome to Nevada. Yeah, thank I'm you. I'm a resident. Yeah, congratulations, Nevada. <laughs> and a patient. Yeah. I just was up there last week. We saw the facility. They're building it out right now as we speak. The dispensary side's open, being built. Um, I'm happy that's happening for you. It's, you know, I guess I'm just too dumb to quit. I, I just sat there for two years stagnant with nothing right. else to do but uh, think of how I could make this happen. So right. the, the four years ahead of time, you know, leading up to this, you're, you're faced with life. I can only imagine what a cancer patient goes through. And I think that this last, the four years prior to my sentencing is just a, just maybe a, a splinter of what they feel like of, of, mortality and realizing that this could be over tomorrow and there's so, nothing you can do about it it's over you know and so I took it humbly I took it I took it as 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 a patient I took it right. like I like I look in their eyes every day and I realize I gotta fix this for my family I gotta make sure my family's good so I corporately structured my my businesses separate mm -hmm. um, I aligned us to where if it would go well then it's structured ideally you know, best case scenario. Um, while I was in, my my princess of a wife just took this thing over like a queen. Yeah. Um, she she Andy, Andy didn't mm -hmm. know anything about this kind of a business. She knew she knew creating an R and D. Um, when it came to to chef in a kitchen or or running a business retail and and 
a la carte. She she really was thrown to the wolves. Yeah. And, and five kids, right? And five kids. <laughs> homeschooling. Like she didn't have nothing else to do. Well, our, our youngest <laughs> suffers from PTSD from the raid. I bet. Um, he's been homeschooled for two and a half years now. Mm -hmm. um, and because of my wife, this kid, East Python in four days, he built a laptop in a day and a half. <laughs> I mean, the kid codes music and he's 11. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you have him on sativa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the positives that come from this are just immense. And that's yeah. really, a lot of people really focus on the negativity of the story, which it needs to be told. Mm -hmm. The way the cops do people and the way the laws are wrote, all that needs to be brought to light. But the positivity that comes from these stories, the people that are built out of these stories, the relationships that are built from the things that happen in these stories are phenomenal. You know, I could, I could sit here and dwell on, on the PTSD my son has. Or I could also focus on the fact that this kid's battled through that two and a half, the four year, well now four years of it, and he's turned into this most amazing little kid because of it. It wouldn't have happened to him to have this not happen. And I don't want everyone to rush out and go get raided so your kid turns out to be <laughs> awesome. Now. Please don't mistake There's me. other things you can do like sports yeah, and Boy Scouts. lots of neat ways to go about that happening. Take your kid to an aquarium every once in a while. But, I, you know, I, I don't want it to be forgotten ever, what the negative side, but I don't want that to be dwelled on because I feel like that energy gets wasted. We put that energy in Yeah, you can't sit in that victim stay. energy no, and that no. rage energy because then it, it just it makes you bitter. It ruins the it rest does. of your life. It does. You know? And, and honestly, I spent the two years in there getting rid of that. The two years praying I don't run into my code of physics. Two years of making sure that bitterness is out of my life mm -hmm. because we're better and... You know, it happened the way it happened for a purpose. Yeah. It did. It, for me, it, it gave my wife that opportunity to be a business owner. It gave her the opportunity to shine. It gave her that to find her. You know, before she probably felt like, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm fully speaking for her. I'll be grounded later <laughs> if, if, I, you know, if I say too much. But I, I feel like she, you know, she found her. She got to blossom into a, a, just a woman of 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 faith and, and, and pride and, and realizing this is hers too. You know, she, I, I think she felt like she was probably behind me through a lot of this because I'm so front man, I'm forward, I, 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 I just take it by the do reins. Her. I just do yeah. it. I get yeah. it done. I don't wait for someone to do it for me. And honestly, she's my wife for 20 years. It's my job. It's my job to do that, you know. And, and, and the two years taught me that it wasn't. The two yeah. years taught me that's her job too. Oh my lord, yeah. like you learned partnership. In <laughs> I did. I, I honestly did because when you don't get to see him for two years, you realize how what a great partner you got, especially when you come home and she's still there. And you couldn't see her. At all. And, I mean, and I'll tell you, just kind of off the topic a little bit, but still on. It, my birthday is in April, so I missed two birthdays. There wasn't a day in April I didn't get a birthday card oh. from my wife. She made sure every single day of April I got a card. And sometimes two. Sometimes, I mean, I, my nickname in prison was Hollywood. <laughs> Literally, the police, the COs who had dropped my mail off sang happy birthday to me the first year because I had so much mail Aww. from her. Yeah. Just to make me feel, you know, she wanted me to know. And You're I like to forgotten. share that because th those little things don't get shared and don't, you know, I literally walked out with a property box full of mail and it's from my wife. It's, I mean, I could pile this table in front of us with a pile that weighs more than my son. Of mail because she wanted and it, there's 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 a lot in there from people I didn't know and friends I didn't know and supporters sure. and, but boy my wife went out of her way I mean she's running a business the house the kids and she still found time take that time away out of your important day and say I love this guy enough to to do it, it just it made me realize that she has a way bigger role in this than I've allowed for and I wasn't on purpose by any means it's just the way it was I just always felt like yeah. I should take care of it let me handle it let me handle right. it and this slowed me down and you know I appreciate that it helped me it, going it really prison helped. opened your heart chakra it opened it. It, it it and my mind too I mean I wrote two books while I was in yeah. I, and I'm not a writer I, I don't write anything you can't even read my name when I write but because of this I just my, my first book I wrote when I was in lockdown for 45 days. I didn't have anything else to do, quite frankly. Um, I counted every brick. I, I knew every ceiling tile. I knew everything in that room. I had a cop that would walk by and give me a hard time all the time. And I asked him for pencils one day. And he's like, why are you going to try and dig your way out? And I said, no, I'm going to write my life story on the wall. Just being a smart ass. And he brought me the pencils in a soapbox. 24 of them. 
and he hands them to me under the, the door. And I remember, because you have to lay on the floor with your face on that gross concrete floor waiting for your pencils. I got them, counted them, sat up, and I got a little roll of paper, and I started to write. And I literally, for, at first it was counseling. It was it was just a way for me to... Journal it. Damn, get let, it yeah, yeah, really, get it out. And 176 pages front to back later, the day I was being rolled up to go to prison, the cop and I had built a report mm. after sharpening my pencils every day. And, oh, how's the life story going? And, you know... <laughs> You're like, it's all right, Shawshank. You know, yeah, we started, we, actually, <laughs> we, we started talking. And not really talking, but, you know, I guess every day when the same guy hands you your food through a little window in your door and hands you your roll of toilet paper for the week, it, you kind of feel like you know a guy, I guess. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's like that. What do you call it? Uh, when you what is it Stockholm syndrome? Right, exactly. yeah. Yeah. I was married. I know yeah. what that's like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he came to roll me up, and uh, I told him, you know, open the window of the bean shoot, and I handed him my book and three envelopes. Aww. I stuck it through, and he, yeah. I, I'll, I won't forget the look on this this big burly CEO's face because he looked through the window like you really did it, huh? Like you did it, and I asked him, would you read it before you send it out? That's all I asked. Re read it. Just let me know what you think. And he was like. Really? You want me to read? He goes, I'm going to read it anyway. It's my job. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'd be honored. And then at, about four hours later, they roll us up to go to prison. He came by and he bought me. He said, I want one signed when it goes on New Year's best time. Uh -huh. And it was, you know. It's, That's uh, encouraging. It, it was you very know. encouraging considering it was his people who. Put you there. Put me there and, <laughs> and entitled me to write that book. You know what I mean? But that was the start. And then when I got down to prison, um, I wrote another book. The first book was from A to Z, Arizona to Zonka, The Rise and Fall of an Empire. And it just explained kind of where I come from. Um, I, I'm a group home kid. I grew yeah. up in the system, which really helped the judge send me to prison. It was his way of going, ah, oh, you like going back. Uh, so I started there and I just, yeah. it kind of set the tone and it showed the struggle um, and what it was like to even make it where I had made it then. Yeah. So it kind of pieces some things together all the way up until the raid. And then the second book is called A Leader of Men. That's kind of my testimony. Um, I was not a faithful, religious, per spiritual person whatsoever before this. I grew up in group homes. I fought for my life. Sure. I, fought, I slept with pencils in my hands to make sure my shoes didn't get stolen or I didn't get raped while I was sleeping. I, mean, I grew up a whole other life that people just don't ever know. And I kept it a secret because I have kids. But I put it in the book because I want people to know that it's real. That we walk around you, you know, like mm -hmm. I, there's, there's guys like me that live lives like that all around you and you don't know it. You don't understand them. Uh, and we're cool too. You know what I mean? A lot of us get grouped into groups of, right. of you know, well, if you grew up that way, you'll probably end up like this. Just you know? statistically speaking. Maybe yeah. you went to prison because this is where you come from. And I, I hit a lot of it to fight that, but I brought it out to show the story. And to teach the struggle and to show that you can make it. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I've had friends who didn't make it that far, who, who took their lives for less. And I never understood why. And I think that was the problem. I tried. I shouldn't have tried to understand why. Because we're all different. We all do this different. This walk yeah. is different. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the reason that we're doing what we're doing now is because of that difference. Right. You know, I'm 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 thankful and humbled for that difference. I really am. It's a gift in its own oh, weird way, isn't it? I, I I was once told as a kid that we choose this life, and it stuck with me. Not maybe because I believe it, mm -hmm. I find it fascinating. Because if I chose this, I'm an idiot. You know, if I chose this walk, I would punch myself in the mouth. You yeah. know, but I also know that I would never want anyone I love, care about, family with. To ever have to do what I had to go through, yeah. I'm glad it's me because mm -hmm. I know I'll kick its ass. I know that we'll, we'll be fine. It's just funny to think of that and that that relevance, that reference that I might have actually chose this back then. What was I doing? I'm one of those people that believes that. Yeah. You know, I'm one of those people, and um, you know, theoretically, you know, mm -hmm. you are on the path you're supposed to be on because you're aware of that. Yes. And then that means that you have made the correct life choices to raise above the karma that put you on that path to begin mm -hmm. with, which you did choose with Creator before you came back. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people don't work on their blocks. Yeah. They just go through life 
self-medicating with big pharma or drinking too much or whatever. I represent those remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the big pharma. Right, um, right, right. But you know what I'm saying. Like yeah. we all choose or don't choose. Yeah. Choose your religion. Sure. But yeah, I think that's brilliant. And, and I know that you've done activist work as well for the VA. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we've I've written. I've done marches. I've uh, we've raised money. Yeah. Uh, I believe in a, a few a few different beliefs. You know, I have, I have a, a, a few different causes that drive me. Um, what drives the, you? The, the VA, especially. Well, yeah. And I'm not a I'm not a veteran specifically. Mm-hmm. My all my family is. I I, I did the different tour. <laughs> I, I did the DOC tour. Um, my family's Marine Army, um, a little bit of everything. But I carry it so far, as far, even in prison, perfect yeah. example, 72-year-old guy, got a 14-year sentence, second-time offense, meth, one gram of meth, 14 years. Are you kidding me? This guy's a veteran. Oh, no. He's a veteran. He's a uh, cancer, two-time survivor. Yeah. And because he's a meth user, and because the minimum mandatories, and because he's homeless, they gave him 14 years. He's got two years left on his 14 years. This man doesn't leave his bed. I mean, he's sick. He's got cancer, cancer eating him up. Eating him up. It's been five years since they've scanned him in there because he was give, given a bill, a clean bill of health. So they never went back to check up on him. And he knows his body. He knows what he's feeling. Mm. So when I got there, none of the CO3s or any of the counselors or any of the people had even helped him file clemency. What's a CO3? Uh, a CO3 would be like your um, COs, your correctional officers, mm-hmm. your, your or your basic officers that walk around and feed you or, or herd you into whatever room you're supposed to go into. Uh, CO3s are a step up where they're they're like your personal counselors. Uh-huh. They're the ones you will talk with when you're trying to get your release date. Oh, like or, therapists? Or like, uh, like not a, necessarily therapists. A liaison? Between? Liaison, yeah. Okay. They're the ones that you'll, you'll talk with when you're getting enrolled into a class. Concierge. <laughs> sort of, yeah. yeah. They, and they have so many cases. So it's like, um, and I don't even know how to put it, kind of like a... Yeah, a, a probation officer okay. almost. Okay, all right. And you report to them. They help you get your release date set up, your packets done, your work done. I mean, they're they're who you go to when you have questions and need help. Okay. That, that's um, who we... So I, pretty much they're the ones that should have been helping this man right. get his packet done for clemency. Right. Um, get any kind of treatment, med- medical health, treatment yeah. done. Yeah, and so I met the guy... A half a gram. I didn't think. No, yeah, he had a, he had a, he had a, a gram. I, I still couldn't believe it. So I helped this guy uh, get his clemency packet filed. Mm-hmm. We got him into the domiciliary in Prescott. Um, I just went into the CO three and made her do her job. Yeah. Um, I that, that's where my heart's at, yeah, uh, yeah. especially the old guys and the young guys. You know, right. to me, the old They're guys helpless. pave the road, yeah. and the the young guys are the ones that are gonna make sure I make it the rest of the way down it. So. Right, right. I just have a, you know, I've seen kids in need of care where I grew up in group homes. Love kids. I would coach or help them all day long. And the old guys, man, the military guys, the guys that fought for us. And I've never been military, so I don't pretend to act like hoorah and I know all that stuff. Or You know, I don't. Which is a healthy respect. It, it is. You know, My dad we, was 25 all, years yeah. military before he passed, and um, his beliefs were a lot different than mine. Right. But you know what? He did three tours, and he's part of the reason that I'm allowed to to do what I do today, uh, exactly. uh, even when he's not here. And I pay that homage and that respect to those guys. And I just, I feel it's appropriate, especially with the way they get treated by our VA system and our, our government system. It's just a shame. Yeah, we and, need to take better care of our vets most staff. Oh, sad. So you just going in and advocating on that guy's behalf helped? Yeah, it helped. Uh, just one his, person showing up because he doesn't have any family. That's a, and, and for him, uh, I can only imagine what it did for him, yeah. being, being a homeless guy with family that he hasn't seen in a really long time and honestly when you're in prison yeah, it's funny but it's more bureaucratic than out here I mean if you don't look cool or act cool or with the cool guys you're not a cool guy and he's an old man that mm-hmm. probably doesn't shower and yeah. lives in a dirty bunk and is homeless and li- has homeless ways and a lot of the other guys probably wouldn't even approach him and yeah, I'm just not like that yeah. I walk by and those are the guys we I'm an able bodied willing working male my job that man did his time I hope when I'm 70 that some youngster looks over at me and goes man I hope I can get you a glass of water old timer I mean I think so much of that's been lost in translation these days completely lost that's why we've got all these lost kids nowadays nobody's adulting I met my dad (laughs) I met my pops at 28 I was 28 years old when I met him I lost him my first Christmas in prison 
I had maybe 10 years with the guy. My life probably would have been a whole lot different with my pops around. Not that it's his fault at all, at right. all. But I know what it means for me to be in my kid's life now. I learned what not to do. The two years being away in prison was the worst thing in my life. Uh, just for them. For them alone. I'm, I'm grown. I know what it's like. I go play poker. I watch some TV. And I go to bed real early. Prison's really easy. It sucks. It's it's miserable. But it's really easy. It's structured. It's, it's probably better away than going to the mall. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the worst part is, is you're stuck in a warehouse with a bunch of dummies. No one goes to prison for being smart, but the white collar guys. You know, everyone else is usually there for being pretty dumb. And if you don't mind living in a Home Depot style building <laughs> with <laughs> rows full of dumb people, then hey, prison's a spot. You know, it's just, it really is. It's that bad. When you have to tell grown men to go take showers, and and honestly, Look, the, they put all my ex boyfriends in one place. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, a dating nightmare right there. <laughs> but the worst part about the the prisons nowadays, though, are the drugs. Yeah. I, I was the president of a three piece patch club, mm. and I have never seen heroin like I saw in prison. That's messed up. And it's scary. Uh, I'm a straight edge guy. I don't yeah. drink because of Crohn's. Yeah. I, you know, um, so going in there with an older number from yeah. being in prison 20 years ago, I get a little bit more respect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also looked at as a leader, not only from our, our guys, but from the prison. Mm -hmm. So they kind of took advantage of me, you know, put me in a position of leadership. I ran one of the buildings in there, but I didn't run it like they ran it, you know. Right. They run it with dope, and they, that, that runs the wheels in there. And I'm a straight edge. So when I got in the building, there was a rule where all the races could share needles. You can't share a meal with another race per a prison rule. But you can share a needle and a drug. Is that right? I swear on my and, life. Wait, is this like it written? This is or Arizona. Is it just like, this is a. It's like not unknown. like you don't walk in and they don't hand you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, there, but that's just how it's ran. Uh, I have a black gentleman. One of my best friends is this black guy that lives next to me. Older guy is awesome. Love him. But technically, I would have gotten trouble had I been just a normal, regular guy, not running anything in there, just and, a and shared meal with him. I could have got beat up for that. But because I ran the building. I did it anyway. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to start race wars. No, no, I get it. But it's, prison... It's got its own set of circumstances. What, and what, what is misunderstood is that it's ran by the inmates that way when it's not. Uh -huh. The inmates don't perpetuate that behavior. The prison does because that's how prison keeps control. When I first hit my yard in Yuma, I haven't been to prison in 20 years. So it's not like I have this, you know, this, this huge memory and, and I know exactly how it's going to go. I've got a good idea, but it's been a long time. As soon as I hit the yard, the first lieutenant walks up to me and goes, who do you run with? And I'm thinking, Desert Eagles, mm -hmm. my motorcycle club. Right. No, no, no. Who do you run with? Okay, we're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a hit. Sounds like, you know, two syllables. What are we doing? I don't know. Please tell me. Help me here. And he says, what race are you? Well, I'm from Australia, but my dad's Scottish. I'm, he's like, no, are you a white boy? Yeah, I'm a white boy. Oh, you're going to go run with the white boys. And he, put me in the house with white boys. So it shows you that that perpetual hatred is driven by the prison wow. for control. Because then they know you. They know these groups, these groups, these groups, and they know all their heads, and then they know how to keep a and uniform. And so they profile probably Absolutely. based on, yeah. Mm. The gang members go here, the black go here, the races go here, yet they make it sound like all these crazy lunatic inmates in there that can't control themselves, starting riots, Wars, all, and there, there's some crazy people there. Don't get me wrong. Prisons are necessary. You, well, I understand it. But about 12 percent of the people that we, about out, out of the 100 percent of the people, about 12 percent should really be there. You know, <laughs> total. I mean, 40 yeah. percent of the people in prison in Arizona don't even have a victim in their crime. So, but they're in prison right now. Arizona is big on locking people up. It's big on prisons. Yeah. Look at Ducey. We just had Senate Bill 1337, agricultural hemp shot down. 32 senators backed it all the way into the House and Senate. Right. And Mr. Doug Douchey takes it, throws it out, vetoes it, and what for? Says we don't have the funding. Meanwhile, he's dumping billions into K-12. Yeah. Taking money from BLM land, hiding it underneath this education K-12 crap, and he's building more prisons. That's all he's doing. When I sat in prison, you realize what a piece of stock inventory you are. When yeah. they walk through and they tell you, hey guys, make sure your houses are clean. The shareholders are walking through today. That's so we won't the search. <laughs> we won't search you on the next quarterly if you make sure your TVs aren't on the locker and are on the tables where they go. We won't shake your houses down and take all your stuff. That's their bartering tool. Because every quarter they come in and they they take all your belongings. They they run in with gun pepper spray guns and 
yell and scream, hands on your head, get out, and they hog tie you, and they throw you on the yard for two days, and they search everything. It's their way of making sure they get rid of the drugs, and the. it's really just a show of force. They run in, they talk trash for two days, and then things go back to normal, and people drinking and getting high. And It's a crazy bureauc bureaucratic scene that I... I no one will understand that dynamic unless you have to walk it. And I just hope that, you know, my book or the stories or being able to speak with, with different Helpful affiliates farms. And, and, and put you it know. out there, yeah, yeah, just yeah. get it out there so people understand. You know, the way I look at it and explain it is imagine your 19 year old kid gets popped with a joint and now because he's got long hair or a couple wrong tattoos in a wrong spot, he's classified. They, they send him to jail on a mandatory minimum because he had over his amount. Now he's in a three yard. His life just went wow. from hippie pothead to now he's a 20 something, 19 something in prison. And the bureaucracy changes so drastically. Now when you're a 19 year old in prison, you're the new guy. You're the front line guy. You're the, you're the warrior. You're the one that, hey, if, if a race war pops off, sorry, bud, you're on the front line. Yeah. So, and I only bring that up because in February, my first February in prison was a race war between the Hispanics and the blacks all over drinking. Everyone was drinking, partying for New Year's. Football game came on. One guy says, F your football team. Other guy gets mad. Two guys punch one. Both races go at it. The entire yard went crazy. Literally 800 guys. You, I watched 800 Hispanics attack 80 black guys. And it oh, literally, no. where, thank goodness we weren't involved and, and didn't have to partake in any of that, but we watched it. That's horrible. And, it, and all over of a drunk guy yelling about a football game. And all I could think, it wasn't even the riot that scared me or worried me. Because I, unfortunately, as a youngster in prison, I'd been there. What scared me was watching the frontliners, the guys on the front line for each side that yeah, go at the it. the young kids. And they're all the kiddos. They're the ones who don't know any better. And it hit me right away that this whole dynamic needs to be told. This whole dynamic needs to be out there because what we're doing with mandatory minimums and what we're doing with these rules and laws that are, are we're just funneling revenue through these prisons. What we've realized we could do in Arizona specifically is make it illegal to be poor. You don't pay your child support or your fines, you're going to prison. It's very illegal to be illegal here. <laughs> it, yeah, Arizona don't play. No, and now not only does Arizona have 85% for legal residents, but if you're illegal, it's 110% of your time. So not that I agree with jumping the border and coming over here illegally or whatever the situation right, is right. or what I do or don't but believe. This just is the reality but it's humanitarian go yeah. to not bring a human and put him in a prison 10% longer than his sentence is allowed and then send him home knowing he's going to be right back here in two weeks so you can do it to him again. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And the difference is those guys that come into the prison now, they don't really care about American rule and law because they go home eventually and then come back. And when they do, they run the dopes in prison. They run because our rules don't really affect them. Because they're not nationals. Exactly. So when you watch the heroin epidemic in there, I literally would chase guys around like, "Don't give him heroin," and literally they would run over and throw it on his bed. And what you would see on the streets that cost you twenty five dollars is five dollars in there. Yeah. So it's half as expensive. Guys are twenty year old, never been in, on dope before in their life, are coming out three months later, slammed and 10 days violating and going back. So the drug epidemic isn't necessarily starting and continuing on the streets as much as it is in the prisons. Yeah, It's so bad in the prisons because like they don't test for spice. Everyone's on spice. With spice. Spice is your synthetic supposed cannabis, but it's this, this uh, marshmallow flower sprayed with chemical where they've re removed certain items from certain cannabinoids to make it look and smell, but it's not, it's poison. People right. are freaking out. I watch guys run across the yard screaming like a, a lunatic, dancing like ballerinas, and then pass out. It's like a PCP kind of thing. Looks exactly like it. Mm -hmm. And these guys are doing it because they can, because they're not being tested for it. The pot's so bad, because they're gonna test you. Right. Can't smoke the pot in there. I mean, I watched the captain tell a guy, guy was in there for his fourth dirty UA. 
fourth through the UA in like three months. The captain tells him, hey, why don't you tell your drug dealer to quit sending in the high level, high quality stuff so your levels will play out and you'll quit getting in trouble. The captain of the prison said that. They know. I guess he figures he can't really do anything because it's so overwhelming yeah. and maybe because he's an employee of sure. these people who are going to go through the shareholders or I don't know. I don't know the political stuff going on behind the scenes. Well, they, they but I guess know. you can't fix it, so at least try to do what you can. They've pulled us in the office and with the wardens before, all the heads, all the guys in, in the leadership positions, the spokespersons. Mm -hmm. They pulled us in and there was a situation where a guy was using in his bed, mm -hmm. uh, using heroin with a needle. Mm -hmm. Officer saw it, went over there to take care of it and handle it, um, and the guy tried to run. Well, when the cop went after him, he fell. The cop got hurt. <gasps> The other cop runs over to try to help and went to spray mace and sprayed the cop. Oh, well, no. Now, now it's, it's a shit show and the, everyone's laughing. Right. So all the inmates are cooing and cawing and they called us into the office to talk about it. As soon as we went in to talk about it, they, uh, they, th they threatened us. They said, well, uh, if your guys want to laugh at our officers while they're right. trying to do their jobs, then we'll come on the yard and take all your drugs and alcohol. And for a guy like me, I go, cool, cool great, <laughs> I'm waiting, uh, please come We need it. a little rehab. But on the other <laughs> hand, it also showed me they, they plan on it because that's what recidivism is built for. If, if you really went to these classes that they provide where you, you sign in and leave and don't really get taught anything other than some stupid D.A.R.E. program from 25 years ago. Right. So I, wrote, I read a book, um, The Code of Extraordinary Mind. I wrote a peer-based curriculum. I submitted it to the call or the prison. Um, the CO3 that I was working with was awesome. She was yeah. like, please submit this. I need the help. That's fantastic. I talked to the author of the book. The author offered to supply soft cover books to the prison to help the class. As soon as the prison got all my info that I sent in, they moved me. They ended the program, uh, wouldn't let us move forward with it, and shipped me out to Kingman. So the program ended. It was just a little peer-based curriculum. You sit here and keep getting high. You're just going to feed them. They, that's what they want you to do. Yeah. I get it. It's boring. It sucks. There's nothing else to do. But, um, you know, we're not helping anyone by continuing to perpetuate this issue and, and keep getting high and using. And I don't know. It just it, it felt like to me that a lot of the, not a lot, but a majority or a percent of the people there or the group there, they wanted to. That they wanted to be there. That they felt like they wanted to. Or they're just helpless. They feel so helpless. They're overwhelmed. They function. They don't see it. They don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And they felt like that it was just going to continue to happen and continue without understanding why. Yeah. And I felt like we could teach them the whys. Right. Show them why. This, uh, we have to take responsibility for what we're doing first. Period. Number one. No matter what it is. And then realize that, look, this, this system is not built for you to succeed. Ever. And and you you breaking every rule and law and, 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 and not trying to to get better is just helping them and we're helping create our own demise and build more and i don't know why anybody wants to do that other than addiction yeah and they know that that, that addiction takes away that ability to to stop you know it's, mm. it's that cycle it's a perpetual cycle and i'll fight it until the end and it, whatever platform i can use to do it and that's what i'll do um, you know i've only been out since february and in the first hundred days we we went public with my pet company. Um, we're on the stock well, Let's market. talk about your pet company. Yeah. Because we haven't talked about that yet. Well, you know, Hempful Farms is the parent company. Um, that was our cafe. Um, from that, we started a company called Weedless, which is a vape and concentrate line. And it's all hemp, uh -huh. CBD from hemp. So we do shatters and waxes. Um, I just take isolate and I make different products from it. What's isolate? Isolate powder is uh, it's a powder that's uh, left over from the distillation process from hemp. Um, there's no, it's a nano extraction technology. We don't use hexane or pentane or chemicals or anything. It's just a um, encapsulated powder that I use in food product. Mm -hmm. I use in vape product and liquid. Um, it's just another way to absorb CBD in your body. And it's at its highest concentrated percent I can find. It's a 99.8% CBD. Wow. We use that. We use a distillate oil, which is an 80% CBD. And then we have a cold press, it's 25. We offer just the different levels 
for you know different ailments. It depends right. what your, your how much level. medication you yeah, need. Absolutely. Yeah. And we found too, it, just like with any medicine, everyone's different. You know, I could tell you this, so it's going to do this great thing for you, and it does nothing. And you take the isolate, and it did nothing for me. It right. just I watch it all day long. It's weird like that. I have I have a special strain that I, it's my go-to. It just makes me feel like everything is good in the world, and right. I'm okay. Well, and that's, <laughs> and that's exactly yeah. how we present. And that's what your medicine do. should do for you. You know. That's how we present it. We just try to, you know, we're all made up completely differently. So I can only share a testimony and share an experience. That's, you know, we were already bound by not being able to speak medically about what we think or, you know, so I don't. Unless we're high and we can do it telepathically. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> osmosis. Learn about osmosis. No, and I'm honestly, what indigo. we... What about you? <laughs> okay, so but with, the, um, with the pets, yeah. especially, these these are really great for doggies yeah, and kitty the, cats and I horses now yep. too i hear the paw putty came from uh my son mm -hmm. my youngest the, the guy in the raid he yeah. is the ceo of paw putty <laughs> um, it, it was my way of saying i'm sorry yeah and hopefully giving something back that he'll be able to you know realize like dad's a fighter dad yeah. just did this for me to make sure that i was okay yeah he'll probably not never understand that until then but that's cool. He'll, um, when he's 40. Right. <laughs> the amazing thing is um, he's a great CEO. He, he loves our Rottweiler, Sarge. That's his mm -hmm. best friend. Sarge was in the raid with us too. So Sarge went through some stuff and oh. had some, some issues afterwards. And, and Christopher wanted to know how we could help him with his anxiety and separations and stuff. So we, used, I said, let's make a dog treat. Let's use the <laughs> CBD stuff. And he took it a step farther and invented a Paul Putty pet pouch where we make a dog bone. And then he makes it fatter and, and hollows it out with a dowel. And you can put any other medicine or tincture in it. So the dog treat's medicated with 33 milligrams of CBD and hemp flour. But then you, if you have a tincture or an antibiotic or something that the dog has to have, it goes inside the dog bone and the dog doesn't know it's there. That's brilliant. He's a, he's a smart little guy. He, he came up with that at six years it's old. It's the sativa, so. isn't it? Yeah, it must be. <laughs> That's brilliant, man. We took it, while I was fighting my case, a, a show called The Marijuana Show came around. It was like the shark tank mm -hmm. of cannabis business. They're based in Denver. Uh -huh. I was on half a million dollar bond, so it wasn't <laughs> like I could just take off to Denver and go pitch my business. Can so, I leave the state? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I need some money. <laughs> I did not. So I turned down the first invite, and then the next month it came back. And I told my wife, I said, you know, the first time, shame on me. Or shame on you, second time, shame on me, right? Yeah. So if I miss this opportunity again, I think it'd be really dumb. Yeah. So I called my lawyer, and I said, hey, lawyer, I have a cash paying job in Denver. Uh, three days, I'm going to be gone. Is it cool? He calls me back and says, I'm not even telling the judge you're leaving. Mm -hmm. That's how much I disagree with this. So, <laughs> so just don't tell anyone. And please, if you don't get if you get in trouble, don't come back. And so against legal advice. Yes. I I felt like it was uh, the right choice for the family and the business to yeah. go. So we loaded up uh, a scion <laughs> in the dead of winter. And bonsai to Denver in a snowstorm, yeah. and we made it. We we got there. We pitched the business. the The ladies running the show fell in love with the pitch, of the story. I think they already knew, and I was yeah. trying to hide it. Yeah. I didn't want to hide it, but I just felt like it's probably smarter <laughs> at yeah. this point. Uh, but she asked us. She said, "If if you guys are chosen to be on the show, would you be able to make it back for the the actual film?" So to me, it led me to believe she kind of knew that I was looking at some time and. She wanted us there. Yeah. So we sat and chatted. She said, I want you to make a video telling us what you need, how much, what you're going to do with it. And we came home. We made a video. I did like a black and white, old school, um, like those old Western movies. Mm -hmm. And I had my kids like uh, laboring over the, the, the island in the kitchen. <laughs> one at a time assembly line and <laughs> I was cracking a whip and we, we were just showing like you know we need to grow we need the money for a clean lab and we won best pitch we won best video um, we won we won like pretty much every award you could win for this and my son and wife were chosen to be on the show oh, how cool. I was actually chosen but I got sentenced yeah. to prison the next right. month so my wife not knowing the numbers uh -huh. not knowing the pitch deck something I had worked on for eight months mm -hmm. not knowing anything 
she had to memorize without a phone call for me. Uh, just talking with the accountant and a couple friends helping. And my son, if you go to Amazon Prime and uh -huh. download the Marijuana Show Season 2, it's all about my wife and son. Uh, my son killed it. He he got a 500 dozen order from uh, Flora, one of the largest dispensaries in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, Starbuds and Elements both ordered. He had handwritten little contracts that he walked up and put That's on. That's so baller. Honestly, <laughs> I, I got to say... He had a 265 pound dude in tears. I was just like so proud of that yeah. little guy. Considering what they were going through, I just right. left. I just went to prison. Right. These guys are up there pitching and saving our collective business lives right. without having the knowledge or, or know how of anything. You know, the family that makes can of oil together. No, they, <laughs> they nailed it. Honestly, I it has over, I think, like quarter million views right now. It, Anyone gets a chance, please. And I don't care about the download. I don't get paid from it. It's not for it's us. It's just your family. If you get a chance to go see it, it's. It, there were four other families on there. I mean, my wife was with like Melissa Etheridge and Russell Simmons. Oh, wow. it's, it's a really great production. I love Russell Simmons. They changed it. It was supposed to be about entrepreneurs getting into the industry. But yeah. once the directors, Kathy and Wendy, found us on our story, they turned it into prohibition and ending it and letting getting people out of prison for That's a flat. That's fantastic. Um, so it pretty much changed the whole dynamic behind season two. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it, it got a lot of uh, footage and, and, and movement on our story to get out there. And, and then honestly, uh, it started one of our best hashtags, haters make me famous. <laughs> it blew our story up. It blew right? our brand up. Like I never would have sold this much product if I wouldn't have got rated. Right? I, I, I really don't think we would have been that popular. Um, I, I, it sounds maybe crass or arrogant. I don't know, but I'm not thankful for it. But you know, I'll I'll turn any bad thing into something good. I just I lived bad as a kid my whole life. Forty group homes and. This is cool. I mean, this is fun <laughs> compared to all that stuff. And it seems like y'all made it through your darkest days. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, mean, <laughs> I, I learned from my testimony and this whole story that this is my life's work. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't put here to, I mean, making money's part of it. We all have to survive and live. But 40% right. of everything we've ever made since 2008 has been donation. And that's the way we run our business. I don't have to make a fortune. I just want to make a living. And, I would love, and part of my living being made is helping. You know, that, that email you get when the, the woman with RA who couldn't write her name just dialed the phone to call you, that's why I do it. But the 20,000 views over a horse that's now being ridden that hadn't been ridden in two years because of a tincture, that's why we do it. And that's because of the CBD tinctures. That's all because of the CBD. Yeah, we, right. we came out with the equine line because, you know, after my son did the pet thing, um, we went public with the pet thing. We had a pet public company come to us, the oldest marijuana trading company on the stock market, um, American Green. It came to us, uh, call letters ERBB if you're looking to buy some <laughs> stock. Uh, but no, they came to us and said, you have an amazing product, you have an amazing brand, how can we help you? And considering the county of Yavapai doesn't want to give me back half a million dollars, um, I need capital. I just need to get going. So we signed a great deal where we have a salary that comes forever which right there is what I fought eight years for, just the loan for my yeah, family. Yeah, sure, stability. We have a partner who loves and believes in us enough to give us the capital to build out a 4,000 square foot facility. And not go sell dope to cops Absolutely. behind your back. <laughs> and stay up front and stay real partners. Our slogan is think outside the bong. You, know, you really got to think outside the norm. Get, get away from what, what you normally would see. I'm really sorry that you went to prison, but I'm really glad you did because yeah. you know what I'm saying? I do. It I feels do. like all this goodness that's just avalanching into yeah. you is a reward. It's humbling. Like, yeah. uh, I don't sleep. Yeah. I get like three hours a night right now just because I... Well, one, you should I probably just, smoke a joint. That I might do. Help. I do a lot. <laughs> I do a lot. A lot. And then I think more, and then I want to do more. And then you and write, then write stuff more, down more. And, yeah, and then you, yeah, I do. Yeah. And then, Andy, are you awake? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that happens. I, yeah. I just, I, I figure uh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, mm -hmm. there's not much time on this planet. Be part of the solution you want to see. Yeah, totally. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and if anybody wants to find out more about what you're doing, where do they go? Uh, or what sites do they find? We have a on? website, hempfulfarms.com. Or, um, Hempful Farms, INC at Gmail is my, my website. 
okay. or my email and then look for Zarka we're going to be launching our edible cannabis line um, we got the license and we close on the building this month um, here we come and like I said, Nevada welcomes you. August 1st. <laughs> August 1st will be in You're the my planet. new neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to say thank you to you guys. You know, I know you're busy. And, and, and to take the time out of your days and, and, and what you guys have going on, to meet someone you don't know, to put a story out there that might not even pertain to you directly, that says a lot about the people that you guys are. It means a lot to guys like me. Especially when we sat in rooms when nobody wanted to hear us. You yeah. Know, so it means a lot. No, you mean a lot to me. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we're all in this together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So thank you for everything you're doing, especially making this good medicine <laughs> for humans and, and doggies and animals and stuff. And uh, thank you for what you suffered through. Yes, ma'am. You thank know, you. it's hard to be away from your kid. Yes. And your wife. We'll never do it again on purpose. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson. Okay. Yes, oh, I got all these honestly. This gray hair is all. The gray hair in my beard. Ugh, this yeah. is my master. <laughs> it's before and after. Before you go in and after you come out, I was like, whoa. <laughs> the whole prison preserves you thing. That's a myth. <laughs> Urban Done with legend. That. Done with that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you and good luck. Thanks for listening, y'all. Chris Martin has such an inspiring crazy story. Um, I'm very humble about his future though and I want to thank him for sharing what he and Andy and the kids and Sarge have gone through and all the good things coming to them. I would like to donate a portion of this week's t-shirt sales off my website lisalandry.com to Pemple Farms knowing that Chris and Andy will probably just donate it to somebody else in the community who needs it so let's all pay it forward. I actually have some plant-inspired t-shirts on the site, so please check that out. 